It's uh, 4 p.m. on the 6th of July, and we are live from DBS Asia Central. Um, I'm Temur Beg, Chief Economist of Group Research at Economics and Strategy, and welcome to our monthly live streamed webinar. Um, today, we will be sort of taking on the cue from what we talked about in June, uh, but more relevantly, we're sort of talking about what is next in this uh, COVID-19 saga, if you will. And the main issue starts from page two, uh, where we have the outline of the presentation. Uh, we will sort of go over the state of the economies, uh, what's happening in the G3 complex, and then in our neck of the woods, some of our in-house analysis on China, India, and Singapore. And we'll top it out with our overall uh, economic forecast for the second half of this year and what that takes us to into 2021. Uh, we will then talk into some of the issues that are in the intersection of the short term and the long term. Uh, so state of the pandemic, uh, what's going on on the fiscal side and the monetary side, and increasingly the discussion that we're seeing all around us, uh, what is the uh, level of thinking at the company level with respect to industrial policy, both with lessons from the COVID-19 issue, as well as the lingering trade tension between the West and China. And that will, of course, be um, leading into the discussion on trade. Uh, we will then end with question. I think we have about six or eight questions from you guys already, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll address those. So let's start with the state of economies and skip over slide three and go straight to slide four. Um, in the G3 complex, uh, it's fairly divergent right now, uh, the narrative. In the U.S., uh, we have highly exuberant markets. Everybody's very well aware of that. We will not spend too much time this time uh, talking about the markets. We do that on a regular basis. I think I'm going to focus more on the economic side this time. Uh, and, and, and I think everybody who reads the newspapers knows that the easing of lockdown that began about a month ago has been complicated immensely in the U.S. in the last few weeks where there's been a resurgence of infection. Now, U.S. is, of course, not the only country where there's been a resurgence or high levels of sustained infection. Brazil and India come to mind. I'll talk about those later. But in the case of the U.S., it's complicated by the fact that it's a large country with internal open borders. So people who are in the south of the country in Arizona or Florida, if they're carrying the germ and if they're flying to New York or elsewhere, um, there isn't a whole lot there is available from a legal recourse to stop them from traveling and potentially spreading that virus, uh, which is why even a regional outbreak carries risk for the entire country because the country remains uh, internally well connected with no restriction of internal travels. Uh, this is, of course, a Big contrast from what China did in end January and early February when there was a nationwide lockdown and intra-regional travel was also severely restricted. That is not the case in the U.S., which is why I think we will see continued difficulties in bringing the virus under control in America. On the policy side, we'll get into this in greater detail, but right now, of course, it is well understood that accommodative policies are here to stay. Uh, and on the monetary side, the Fed is telegraphing that it would like to create even greater expectation of uh, short-term rates being well anchored, and that may be accomplished um, even in a more strenuous manner by a formal announcement of a yield curve control, maybe between zero and one year range. Uh, we'll touch on this later. Uh, and also in Washington, D.C., uh, there is discussion between the House Democrats and the Republicans, as well as those in the Senate, about the next round of fiscal support package, whether to extend some of them or not. Uh, this is where uh, the flow of economic data come into play. And we'll see in a little while that that actually might be counterproductive to getting more supporting measures done. In Europe, by and large, the pandemic is easing, Sweden notwithstanding, but elsewhere, whether you're in Germany or France or in Southern Europe, uh, things look significantly better from a pandemic perspective than they did uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and of course, just like the U.S., very heroic response, both on the monetary and fiscal side. Uh, we have seen uh, some historic announcements in recent months, particularly this pact between the French and the Germans to uh, look at a five-year time horizon of European budget and support significant expansion of outlays with a specific goal towards supporting Southern Europe. Um, and um, our expectation is that the Germans will lead um, the European nations on the July 17th summit to get some sort of a deal done so that this package, the large recovery package, is uh, finalized. 
Um, I see a typo in there. It's not the large recovery will be finalized, but the rather the large recovery package will be finalized uh, likely on the 17th of July uh, summit. Uh, and then in Japan, uh, we have very little story to tell in terms of the pandemic, but the economy uh, still remains, you know, highly beta to the rest of the world, trade flows. And when you look at surveys like the Tankin uh, of uh, businesses, uh, sentiments are still very, very poor. And we haven't seen any major sign of telltale turnaround. So for the year, even though the pandemic seems fairly under control, uh, we're looking at fairly severe contraction in the Japanese economy, just the way we are seeing in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, staying with the data issue, and when, so the next slide, slide five, uh, shows you the economic surprise uh, element of the U.S., China, Eurozone data flow over the last uh, year or so. It's interesting that the U.S. data has been significantly better than expected uh, relative to the extreme doom and gloom that was being um, projected by professional forecasters even a month ago. Uh, and this is the point that I was making earlier, that this sort of data flow may get in the way of a fourth round of support package in the U.S., uh, particularly uh, Senate Republicans will probably argue that there isn't a whole lot of additional palliative needed for the U.S. economy, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Fed backstop for credit, uh, and the support for public issuance. All of those have led to uh, cash on people's hands, some degree of protection of people's livelihood, and salutary impact on equity market and fixed income market. What more do you need to do? Uh, which is why I'm putting a question mark around the fourth package that is now circulating the corridors of uh, political Washington, D.C. Uh, one thing that is um, interesting is, um, well, interesting in hindsight, uh, nobody really saw this coming, uh, is this huge spike in uh, savings rate. Uh, so in the U.S., household savings rate got, went from about 8% to 26%. I think it went to about 30% in April and by May it had come down a bit. In the European area as well, we have seen savings rate go from uh, low teens to uh, high teens in the last few months. Uh, these are discretionary savings. People are nervous. People are getting a lot of cash in transfers. But because of the pandemic, because of restrictions, they're not going out to spend that money. This money will get spent, and that will translate into a decent bump in retail sales in the coming months. No doubt about that. Uh, we're not expecting U.S. households to maintain such generous savings rates month after month. Uh, but it also underscores the extent of uncertainty that is prevailing among the population, that people do have a lot of cash on their hands, but they're not that inclined to spend it because they don't know when the next round of cash will come into their hands, especially if they're worried about their job market prospects. If we go to slide six, uh, what we see is, uh, the again, the developed part of the world, U.S., Italy, Japan, Germany, and this is Google Mobility data, uh, which sort of picks up the footfall traffic uh, being registered in Google devices around the world. And what that shows on a day-to-day -day basis is that, you know, we have all, all countries from the UK to Germany, everybody is significantly better in terms of footfalls to retail stores, uh, cafes, recreation, and so on. But nobody's really quite gone back to 100% yet. Uh, even a country like Germany, where things have been normal for a good two months now, we're still about 6 7% below trend. Um, the U.S. is kind of remarkable that despite the very large number of new cases, um, I think it's about a quarter of a million in the last five days aggregated, uh, things have still showing no sign of people sort of stepping out. Although maybe, you know, it is possible that once we start seeing July data, we will see a bit of a dip in people heading to restaurants elsewhere, despite the summer weather, because there is this significant nervousness about the surge in infections there in the last few weeks. Uh, interesting is that a place like UK still substantially below trend, uh, not like uh, Italy or Japan, where things are you know more closer to the Germany US level. So we've had lockdown, then we have had easing, and how the economists come out is going to be a function of not only to what extent the pandemic is under control, but also to the extent that large amount of fiscal support measures are in place. And this takes us to slide seven, where we look at measures of lockdown stringency, which is on the vertical side of this axis, and measures of fiscal support measures, uh, both above and below the line on the horizontal side of this axis. And this scatter plot is uh, instructive, that a country like China, which has had fairly high levels of stringency 
although it's eased up significantly since the highly stringent days of February, um, it has not actually gone out with very deep pockets and hasn't uh, pushed out massive stimulus measures. Uh, you could argue that this is because they're already highly indebted. You could argue that they think that the crisis is mostly a supply side crisis. There isn't a whole lot you need to do to stimulate demand. It'll come back the moment supply is restored. Whatever the reason, the Chinese have been very different from the rest of the world in terms of the magnitude of their fiscal and monetary support measures. Uh, by contrast, Italy, Germany have really taken out the fiscal bazooka. We're talking about 35, 40% of GDP worth of support measures. Uh, and then behind them are UK, France, US, uh, Belgium as well. Uh, again, 15, 20% of GDP worth of measures. I think that countries that take out such large bazookas will be eventually okay, as long as they get the pandemic under control. I think in the live versus livelihood issue, these countries have definitely erred on the side of caution to protect livelihoods. They'll be okay economy-wise. What happens in the lives issue is still an open question, particularly with respect to the U.S. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, we sort of transition away from discussing what's happening in the G3, more to our neighborhood, starting with our in-house now casting measure of China. So what we do here is we are trying to get a sense of GDP before GDP comes out. Um, so the second quarter only ended five, six days ago. No country in the world has second quarter GDP, but we are ready to make a call, having looked at data on a high frequency basis that has been coming out lately. Uh, so what we see here is that whether it is fixed asset investment in China or industrial production or credit growth, everything saw terrible times in February, March, and everything has sort of come back substantially. We're still well below trend. Make no mistake about that. No single variable is showing any signs of going above trend yet, but it's not as bad as it was three months ago. It's not as bad as it was two months ago. So things have come back somewhat modestly. And when we put together these high frequency variables and try to get a sense of um, where they sort of you know, point toward in terms of where should the economy be going as far as formal real GDP data print is concerned, well, that takes us to the next slide for China that our now casting model is saying for the April, June quarter, growth will be almost 4%, 3.9 to be precise. And although we have no data whatsoever for the months of July, August, September, other than the fact that we have already seen in this third quarter a furious equity market rally in the last five days, uh, but we're not basing our now cast based on that. It's basically leading properties of various uh, historical data that we have, and that's showing that for the July, August, September quarter, we could be seeing uh, close to 5% growth. So that's the um, sort of the quantitative indication if we uh, we have right now 3.9 for the second quarter and about 4.7, 4.8 for the third quarter of this year. So China, as I showed in the earlier chart, but even on the slide nine, it's, it's very clear that uh, the turnaround is fairly robust. Uh, the momentum of turnaround has certainly eased uh, in the last couple of months. So that probably is instructive and a cautionary um, warning for the rest of the world that you will get very, very impressive deltas as soon as the lockdown ends and the spike in discretionary saving would lead to quite a bit of spending uh, and, and retail sales will look pretty good. It will make companies happy. But to what extent that pop is sustainable is a very big question. And given what we're seeing in China, which has been successful in controlling the pandemic, but still not been very successful to get a very strong recovery going, I think is telling. And when we look at the rest of the world, we should be probably seeing things from that lens to some extent. When you go to slide 10, you see that the impact of China rebounding, I mean, I'm using the word rebounding very generously, but it is certainly, you know, come back a lot from where it was. Um, it's uh, had a salutary impact on global shipping. So Baltic dry freight uh, went basically vertical in the month of uh, June, a massive rally. Um, it's not exactly gone back to revisiting the highs of uh, a year ago, uh, but certainly uh, much, much better than anything we have seen since uh, the third quarter of last year. Um, so that's good. Uh, countries that have significant exposures to trade with China would be pleased by this development, that global drive freight movement led by China is picking up. But again, uh, we, we would have to be cautious about how strong the momentum is and how sustainable it is going forward. Um, and uh, that 
is something that will make or break, I think, global trade demand uh, in the very near term. China really has to lead the way. If they don't, then nobody else would, in my view. Uh, moving on from China, in slide 11, we go to India. So again, we are now casting the uh, Indian uh, GDP outlook based on the series of variables that we have on the screen right now. Uh, we look at auto sales, commercial vehicle sales, government revenue, credit, uh, industrial production, trade, and of course, public sector capital spending. Um, and uh, Indian data tend to be fairly noisy, but over time, they do give us a decent idea about at least the direction of the economy. Uh, and we were, of course, worried about India long before the pandemic because of the twin balance sheet crisis and fairly relentless slowing of growth momentum over the last couple of years. Um, so when we go to slide 12 and look at the overall now cast of India, uh, to us, it's a mix of, you know, pre-pandemic headwinds uh, mixing with the tremendous headwind of the pandemic itself. Uh, and the picture is, of course, not pretty. Um, Radhika Rao, our India economist, uh, and Daisy Sharma, our India analyst, uh, together uh, prepared this now cast. And they're looking at about a 12, 13 percent contraction in the second year, a quarter on a year on year basis. And then only marginal improvement in the third quarter, about an 8.7 percent contraction on a year-on-year -year basis. So we'll take stock of what all these numbers mean on an annualized basis a little later, uh, but for the time being, let's just you know keep these numbers in mind and move on to slide 13, where we look at Singapore. In Singapore, uh, the data have been, again, relentlessly weak, particularly the tourism sector, travel sector, where a substantial amount of dynamism is fed through to uh, Singapore's day-to-day uh, -day economic activity, and that's been sucked out completely by the virtual sort of shutdown of global travel and tourism. Uh, and that is, of course, acting as a huge drag to the economy. But when you look at trade, uh, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, it, it hit a low uh, a little while ago, but, you know, more than one standard deviation below trend. Uh, but since then, it's come back to some extent. Uh, and I would attribute that mostly to two factors. One is some pull from China, and second is Singapore's large pharmaceutical sector seeing some demand for global pharma products um, and, and therefore benefiting from that. Uh, but when we go beyond that, uh, which of course has some relevance for industrial production, but when you go beyond that, look at what's happening to credit growth, what's happening to residential market performance, of course, those are uh, very, very poor still. So slide 14, uh, which sort of shows our now cast for Singapore, um, uh, you know, hard to tell, you know, uh, characterize whether it's better than others or not. Uh, by Singapore standards, these are very poor numbers. In the second quarter, we're looking at close to 9% of GDP contraction on a year-on-year -year basis, and about 5.8, so around 6% contraction in the third quarter of this year. So, when one puts all this together um, and, and starts thinking, you know, where are these economies beyond this low frequency numbers? Can we get even better sense? Well, yes, we can. And slide 15 is an illustration of that. Um, this, again, takes us back to the Google mobility data that we were talking about earlier. Um, and when you see here, you can see which countries are going back to normalcy and which are not. So Taiwan is really the big star performer in Asia, never really had to scale back substantially. Uh, in terms of uh, livelihood, uh, there was some nervousness, some caution, uh, but then it's been a, almost entirely uh, sort of, you know, made up for that loss. And now it's sort of back to normal as far as traffic to retail and recreation is concerned. And uh, the other country that is going hand in hand with um, Taiwan, despite a bit of a jitter in Seoul, is uh, South Korea. Uh, so those are the two leaders of the pack in Asia, followed by Hong Kong. Thailand also has been remarkable and easing things up and still not showing any major outbreak. Uh, and then a country like Indonesia, where the numbers on the pandemic, which I'll show you in a momentarily, are very, very bad. But on a lockdown basis, they're not that stringent at all. Um, and then that's followed by Malaysia. India, uh, although has taken a huge hit and has started easing things up, as you can see, people are not still going to restaurants and cafes and visiting museums. They still are staying away, even though officially uh, stringency has eased a bit. And that takes us to slide 16, where again, we repeat that stringency versus stimulus analysis. As you can see, um, we put China aside. China has been a bit of a special case, but countries like Philippines, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, 
have had fairly stringent policies in place, but very small, relatively speaking, support measures to fill that gap um, uh, that is induced by the lockdown, which is why when we think about the growth outlook of India and Indonesia in particular, uh, we worry a lot because they took very tough measures to protect lives, but they have not taken very strong measures to sub supplant livelihood. Um, from there, on the right-hand side, of course, you have the more wealthy economies of Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, with very large support packages, they're followed by Korea and Hong Kong. Even Thailand has had a very strong fiscal response to that. So Thailand would be one of those countries where stringency has come down, they still have generous packages in place, and altogether, they're probably looking at a better exit out of this pandemic than the Indonesia's, India's. Um, uh, and then uh, the two other countries that I should mention is Vietnam and Taiwan, the two superstar uh, cases in Asia in terms of dealing with COVID-19. Uh, so for them, not having very large packages sort of makes sense. They weren't that stringent. They were successful early on. And for them, the economic cost has been uh, fairly small commensurate with the cost in terms of lives as well. So go to slide 17, taking all of this into one big uh, uh, table, putting all the high frequency data and the now casting and everything to see what our forecast uh, forecasts are for 2020 and 2021. And just as a sanity check, I put the June 2020 IMF forecast uh, next to ours uh, to get you a sense of whether we are significantly bearish or bullish relative to the multilateral agencies. So what you see here is that, you know, we're looking at about 2% growth in China, not that different from where we were three, four months ago. It uh, really, you know, sort of depends on, you know, the coming few months. If China manages to keep the pandemic under control, even if they don't come up with additional support measures, I have a feeling that their 2% growth would be definitely achievable. Uh, beyond uh, China, we have, of course, looked at issues like uh, Hong Kong, and India, where again, four, four and a half percent contraction for the whole year seem to be on the cards. Uh, worse would be Singapore 5.7 and Thailand 5.5. But as I said earlier, Singapore is already benefiting from the pull uh, trade wise from China and Thailand, at least in the last month or so, seems to be doing very, very well in terms of restoring livelihoods. And maybe there is some upside surprise to that five and a half percent contraction number that we have there. Then there is Vietnam, like I said earlier, our star economy, uh, likely to grow in positive terms, uh, other than China, the only ones in our sample. And then all of these countries will probably have some degree of V-shaped trajectory in Q4 of this year and early next year, which will pave the way for positive growth in 2021. But these numbers are not that impressive. And in many cases, we are somewhat more cautious about the outlook than the IMF is. Uh, and we, therefore, don't expect nominal GDP or real GDP in these countries, the level that is being close to the end 2019 levels for at least a couple of years. So even the growth rates for 2021 would look impressive. The level of GDP, having gone through the contraction in 2020, would not be able to recover to the 2019 level for at least a couple of years. I think that illustrates the deep, massive cost of this crisis and uh, we are not particularly optimistic that there is substantial upside risk to those forecasts. Um, so that's the end of the first part of the presentation, where we're basically looking at where the economies are going. Uh, now, on slide 18, we start looking at the issue of the markets and what they're looking at. And I've got six factors in here, pandemic, fiscal monetary industry policy and trade, I guess that adds up to five factors. Um, and so let's look at the pandemic data. Normally, I start my presentation with that, but this time I put it halfway through. Um, so there are several ways to visualize this. Uh, those of you who were in our live stream last month would be familiar with this sort of visualizations. It's basically a proverbial sort of curve flattening narrative to follow just by looking at these on a per capita basis on a log scale. So if the curve is flattening, by definition, these curves will flatten because the rate of infection would be sort of heading on a delta basis going to zero. Um, yes, no surprise, U.S. is still number one in the world, followed by Brazil. Uh, Brazil will probably overtake the U.S. in confirmed cases per million by the time we have the next live stream. Uh, and in the rest of the big countries that were commanding the headlines uh, two months ago, uh, curves are by and large flat. So whether it is Iran or France, Spain, Germany, U.K., uh, it's been a tough ride, but they are leaving 
um, the second quarter, entering the third quarter of this year, with some degree of confidence that the infection and the outbreak are under control. Uh, moving on to slide 20, uh, same data, uh, but for Asia. And here the data is a little more heterogeneous. We first look at the case of Singapore, which had a very big spike through the months of April and May uh, as the virus spread through the dormitories of construction workers. Things have come down under control to a large extent since then, um, although this chart is inadequate to show the Delta declined very, very well. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a different visualization for that momentarily. But the three countries where, of course, the curve is nowhere close to flattening would be India, followed by the Philippines, and followed by Indonesia. And I think in, in, in all three of those cases, one can argue that the actual numbers are probably much more than what these estimated confirmed cases are showing uh, simply because of the large informal part of the economy and large parts of those uh, who are in the informal economy who are serviced by the informal part of the healthcare system. And those numbers simply don't show up in official data. Um, but nonetheless, even if you assume that these are underestimates, they are still now basically two, three, and four in Asia almost. Uh, and, and likely to do so. Uh, just like I said, Brazil will overtake the U.S. Uh, by the time we have the next live stream. I'm quite sure that Indonesia would overtake the flatliners here, South Korea and Malaysia, uh, by, by significant margin by the time we have the next live stream because there is no sign of the infection abating there either. Now, as I said earlier, that there are different ways of visualizing this. These sets of visualizations are very similar to what we had shown you in the last live stream, but the next set are different. So page or slide 21 uh, is uh, on the horizontal axis, the total number of confirmed cases, where in the vertical axis we have the new cases, but on a aggregated basis to smooth the chart out. So five days of aggregated data. And, and these are um, uh, vivid in illustrating the dynamic of COVID-19. So you see a country like the US, uh, it just kept went up and up and up, total number of cases, highest in the world, I think something in the range of two and a half million. Uh, and now on a five-day aggregated basis, over 100,000 infections uh, uh, for a long time, uh, I think something in the range of a quarter of a million people uh, in the last uh, five days or so, 238,000 to be exact in the last five days. Brazil is also looking pretty uh, alarming with 194,000 in the past uh, five days or so. And that's what you see in these charts, um, that uh, Brazil's red line and U.S.'s black line are sort of side to toe to toe going forward and, and, and no sign of them coming down. Um, by contrast, Russia, which was looking very alarming for a while, now is just showing some degree of uh, relief uh, from a day to day new outbreak basis. Uh, now, you contrast that with the uh, stories in Italy and France, uh, Spain, and so on, uh, things have certainly gotten much, much better. And the healthcare system can certainly deal with a few thousand cases a day. It's only when you're at 10,000, 50,000, things become very, very difficult. Uh, on slide 22, uh, same data uh, or same methodology, but uh, the data of Asian countries. Um, and this is where the story of India becomes very uh, vivid. In the context of Asia, uh, we not only have the most number of cases, but on a five-day basis, uh, the, it's been almost relentless the way new infections have accelerated. Um, and uh, Indonesia, as the blue dot, also shows you similar sort of worrisome trajectory, followed closely by Philippines uh, with a gray dotted line. Uh, and, and here's where you see the success of the likes of Vietnam, a yellow line, uh, Taiwan, a uh, red line, uh, even Thailand, for that matter, the blue-ish line, uh, solid line. Uh, which have all sort of, you know, come down to a trickle now. Uh, in the case of Vietnam, Taiwan is basically one or two cases a day. In the case of uh, Thailand, it's like 10 cases a day or so. So these countries, COVID-19 is not even commanding headlines as far as domestic outbreak is concerned. Um, so having seen the uh, illustration of where the pandemic is moving, what the takeaways can we have? I mean, firstly, we are nowhere close to the end of this pandemic, especially for these large populous countries are concerned. And as long as those large populous countries like the U.S., Brazil, India have large cases, um, you will have a very difficult time having worldwide travel being restored, 
uh, and then that would keep on getting in the way of global aviation, tourism, travel, and so on. Uh, and hence, um, it's, it's a global issue. Uh, some countries putting the COVID-19 to rest would not mean a lot if that country is linked to the global economy. So the global economy would need most of the world, uh, particularly the large countries of the world, uh, to be able to deal with this conclusively. And unfortunately, U.S., Brazil, India show that we're nowhere close to that yet. Second issue is, of course, the um, uh, both the narrative with respect to antivirals and vaccines. Uh, are we going to have effective treatment in the near term? Because then, of course, uh, even some of these uh, countries with lots of infection, people will stop worrying because now there is care available for them. Uh, I would be careful. Uh, there is, of course, a heroic uh, weapons race, arms race going on worldwide among scientists in the U.S., China, Europe, elsewhere in Asia. Um, but uh, to the extent that one can come up with a palliative or uh, antiviral that can handle billions and billions of people's uh, potential infection or a vaccine that can take care of all 7 billion people, I think we're still talking about a year at least before those things become standardized or available. So we should not hold our breath in that regard. Moving on to slide 23, uh, which takes me to the issue of fiscal policy. And that will begin with our slide 24 where we're looking at our deficit projections for uh, key Asian economies as well as U.S., Japan, EU. And I think uh, nobody would be surprised to see that countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, U.S. have very large fiscal packages uh, and uh, the rest of Asia have opened up their wallets, but not as generously as those countries. But then the question becomes, should we worry a lot about this fiscal deficit or should we not? Um, given that you know rates worldwide have come down substantially and we are seeing inflation you know absent if you will everywhere uh, whether it's in the commodity space or manufactured goods or even in food where there were some worries that supply side disruption would lead to some food price inflation not really um, so perhaps uh, this is not the time to worry about those big jump in those red bars uh, markets will be forgiving ratings agencies will be forgiving uh, as long as the countries are spending the money wisely Look at slide 25, where we see uh, U.S. interest payments as a share of GDP, government interest payments, over the last 32 years. As you can see, it's a steady decline in interest payment, although during this phase, U.S. had deleveraging through the 90s, uh, some re-leveraging up with the Bush tax cuts in the 2000s, followed by, again, Obama years when there was some degree of consolidation, and again, the last three years of Trump tax cut and fiscal expansion. You would not be able to tell any of those narratives by looking at this chart, which shows nothing but a relentless steady decline in interest rates all the way from 88 to 2020. And if this is going to be the par for the course of the U.S., it will drag interest rates down elsewhere in the world, too, because inflation is also fairly global these days. Uh, and as a result, uh, I don't think countries that are running large deficits in a responsible countercyclical manner at this juncture wouldn't necessarily have to worry too much. Moving on to slide 26 which paves the way for monetary policy. And there I really will focus on the U.S. Um, page 27, uh, we have seen among the G4 central banks, here I have Fed, uh, BOE, BOJ, and ECB's policy rates in this chart, as well as their combined balance sheet as a share of GDP on the black line. Uh, as you can see, just extraordinary, the monetary response. Uh, G4 central banks have added over 10% of GDP in their balance sheets. Uh, over the last three months or so, and they're not done. Uh, U.S. Federal Reserve balance sheet is something in the range of $7 trillion now. By the time the year is over, given the announcements that they have made with respect to asset purchases, that number will probably reach $9 trillion. So you can expect to see this black line continue to go over and cross 50% of GDP in no time. And as we all know, uh, the measurements, uh, measures taken by G3 central banks, followed by the rest of the world, have been unprecedented in their magnitude and their breadth. Uh, and so far, um, the central banks are winning the battle. They're convincing the markets that financial conditions will remain easy. They're convincing the market that this sort of uh, injection of liquidity would not lead to inflationary problems, maybe asset price inflation, but not consumer price inflation. And they've certainly convinced the markets that this is not irresponsible and they know what they're doing and they're not going to be debasing their currencies. So normally under these circumstances of very large central bank operations, you would expect inflation expectations to grow up, long-term interest rates to go up, or currencies to become volatile. We have seen none of these at all. 
So next up uh, for the Fed is uh, what I talk about on the slide 28, uh, yield curve control. Uh, we have heard many Fed governors uh, allude to this in uh, recent weeks. And the basic idea is that from zero to three year uh, part of the yield curve, the Fed is keen to anchor market expectations somewhere around and below 0.4%. And, and, and therefore, they would want to make it a little more formal and take a page out of the Bank of Japan. Uh, I think that uh, this has potentially only marginal benefit because the market is already expecting rates to remain exceptionally low, as clearly seen in the swaps rates and futures markets for interest rates. Uh, and uh, and therefore, uh, it might be a bit too much uh, and unnecessary, but uh, it is it is what it is in the sense that the Fed will very likely do it. Um, and uh, and the Fed is basically going moving away from setting the quantity of asset purchase to setting the price of the asset, uh, particularly in the case of interest rates in this uh, juncture. And my last point on that slide, I think, is symptomatic of this entire uh, issue, is that maybe this is all very academic. The Fed already owns 20% of all net U.S. government debt issued. And of the longer dated securities, which is about 10 years, above 10 years, uh, the Fed owns about 40%. So a lot of the debt has already been, to so to speak, monetized. And that uh, any further commitment to buying more assets to keep rates low, uh, I don't think will change the market's view that much. The market is persuaded already. Uh, moving on to uh, slide 29, uh, the issue of industrial policy. Uh, that takes me to the two boxes in slide 30. It's been um, interesting for me personally and some of my colleagues as well over the last couple of months in our discussions with uh, companies to hear a lot of concern about what's going to happen to the supply chain in Asia and what sort of corporate strategy should companies pursue given how vulnerable everybody felt given the pandemic. One point I make to everybody is that even if you had your supply chain in your home country, the pandemic would have been quite bad for you uh, because it's not like, you know, countries were all operating perfectly in internally and not trading externally. Uh, things had shut down internally and externally elsewhere. So I, I can't understand why people think of the pandemic as a very big cautionary tale about supply chain disruption, because even if all supply chain was embedded inside a country, that would have been uh, affected just the way it's been affected in a global supply chain. Well, regardless of my view on this issue, I have taken away from these meetings with corporations that they are certainly thinking about more home bias, bringing uh, R&D more in-house, uh, retaining more savings, building more inventory, do some more insourcing than outsourcing, and get themselves as close to the government as possible to get a government umbrella, if you will, uh, to ensure against any further risk of macro dislocation going forward. The likelihood of companies moving in this direction is high. To the extent they move, I think it's still anybody's game. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about insuring and diversifying our supply chain, we're really talking about China and how to move away from China, how to divest away from China and so on. Um, and my understanding, having talked to numerous people in China, uh, both multinationals who have businesses there and Chinese individuals who have businesses there, is that from a pure business perspective, cost of production, availability of high quality infrastructure, logistics, from those perspectives, China still is unparalleled globally uh, for large manufacturers. Uh, so if it is a decision purely made on business considerations, most companies would not leave China. But I think we can all agree that we'll move beyond the economics of sanctions and we're now in the world of politics and security related issues, which then become uh, directives that companies find it very, very hard to avoid. If their government is saying that you are jeopardizing national security by building in China, that company will have to move out sooner or later. But it cuts both ways. You may want to divest away from China and it may be unsound from a business perspective, but sound from a national security perspective, but you may end up also losing your access to China as a result. So that is one consideration I think will weigh on the boardrooms of businesses going forward. Uh, and companies that do take businesses back to the US or to Europe because of political reasons, I don't think they will be hiring a lot of people. The reason they moved out of the West was because labor was expensive, and if anything, labor has become more expensive since then. Uh, 
uh, I think they will embrace automation, hire robots, and maybe hire some local engineers and technicians at the high end who can manage this automation as opposed to creating assembly lines the way they used to exist in the 70s and 80s. That is just not going to happen. And also, instead of going back to the U.S. or Europe, I think for many multinationals, the dip in the water, uh, dipping their toe in the water on this matter would be to move to Southeast Asia, create some redundant supply chains there, and see how good the logistics, how good the infrastructure are to pursue basically a china light strategy. Time will tell, but I think that's the sort of stuff that are coming our way in the coming months. Finally, on trade, I want to spend a little bit of time on that. So slide 31 is our final bullet, and let's go to slide 32, um, which shows the dependency of Asian economies on trade over the last three decades. So starting in 1990, 90, going all the way up to 2018, 2019, depending on data availability. And what you see here is absolutely remarkable that with the exception of Vietnam, not a single Asian economy in the last 30 years has gone more intense as far as trade is concerned. Vietnam has certainly tried to become the next China, has embraced manufacturing and export-led growth, and their embrace of globalization is palpable in this chart. But the rest, very disappointing. Um, Malaysia, I'm not surprised because commodity prices have corrected, so maybe that has brought down the value of trade and therefore the trade GDP ratio. But what's the excuse for the rest? Uh, when you look at Thailand, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, uh, these countries should have or did, were supposed to be the ch champions of globalized trade, and they have gotten richer over the time, but they have not necessarily increased their trade intensity. Uh, Philippines to some extent, but that too after a decade or so of decline. And then you have three countries at the bottom of this chart. It's hard to even tell them apart. China with the light yellow line, India with the dark yellow line, and Indonesia with the gray line all sort of merge on top of each other by the time we're in 2016, 2017 in this chart. And these countries are all well below 50% of trade GDP ratio. So China... I think surprises a lot of people. Everybody thinks China grows on the back of exports and without export, China will come crashing down. The answer is actually not quite correct. China still gets massive amount of positive cash flow and market access because of trade. And it is a very important part of its economy, but it's not the biggest part of the economy. The rest of the economy in terms of services consumption, local manufacturing, local real estate, those things take up substantial amount of China's GDP. Um, and hence, the trade GDP number itself is need to be seen with some degree of caveat. Uh, you can't just look at this chart and say, well, India and China are the same path. They're not. Uh, China is far more trade dependent. Uh, India is sort of catching up, not quite well. But again, it's a really what you import. I mean, are you importing high quality uh, construction material to carry out infrastructure project? Or are you highly trade dependent because you import a lot of discretionary goods? Uh, so the former is true for China. The latter is true for India. So the ratio alone will not tell you that whole story. So where are we going with respect to trade? And that takes me to slide 33. We are not in a good place at all with respect to trade. And this is not a function of trade war. Trade war did not help, obviously. But this chart that I have on the screen on slide 33 right now tells you a rather alarming story that we prospered tremendously in the first decade of this century, 2000-2009, on the back of increased globalization and very rise, a very sharp rise in trade GDP ratios. But since then, trade has softened and cor corrected substantially. So global merchandise exports took a huge downward correction in 08, 09, 10, and has not recovered ever since. In fact, in the last couple of years, even that shallower slope had gotten even further shallow. Perhaps that reflects trade war. Uh, and, and so that is our starting point. We're significantly below long-term trend. And even that trend over the last couple of years has worsened. So that takes me to slide 34, where you see WTO's scenario for global trade in the next couple of years, uh, starting with 2019, but then also 2020, and then going to 2021 um, prognosticating where things are going to go. And the two scenarios that the WTO has are sort of what they call optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. In the optimistic scenario, by the end of 2021, so fourth quarter of 2021, global exports demand or supply sort of reaches back to the 
trend level um, uh, of uh, what we saw in 2018-19. Uh, which itself was, of course, much, much weaker than the previous trend, which was weaker than the previous trend. So even under a dismal trend reversion, mean reversion perspective, things are looking pretty dicey. Um, and uh, you can only imagine if the worst case scenarios were to manifest where we see renewal of lockdowns because of the virus going out of control, uh, it'll be far beyond 2021 because before global trade even comes back to close to 2019 levels. Slide 35 is me on a soapbox. Um, I see and detect this narrative everywhere that globalization is over. We need to look inward. We need to bring more anti-fragile systems, bring more uh, uh, resiliency by hoarding goods, manufacturing locally, um, sustaining larger inventories, and so on. I think these reactions are visceral and dangerous for the overall prosperity of the world. Um, shutting away from, shooing away from trade is, in my view, a lose-lose proposition for the vast majority of the economies in the world. If you give up trade, you give up on transfer of technology, of information, of foreign know-how, all of those things will come back and haunt you. Um, so which is why my first point is that Cold War with China is a lose-lose, not a zero-sum game. Uh, what the Obama administration did in their last a few years, I think, is the way to go, engage China on a multilateral basis, bring the Europeans and the Australians and Singaporeans on one side, demand better respect for intellectual property and so on. And those things can only be accomplished, I think, at the multilateral level. And that, again, re uh, underscores the point that, you know, we need better communication, more information sharing, not less. Um, and, uh, and similarly, beyond trade, uh, if you are not going to be open to the rest of the world, you'll probably end up exacerbating uh, inequality because whatever boom that takes place by turning inward would benefit the rich disproportionately and would probably pick havoc with workers' rights. Finally, I think this is the key issue of understanding our interdependence, that whether we're sitting in tiny Singapore or very large Indonesia, we're all every year affected by climate change related issues. And those are, again, issues that need to be solved at the global level, not by turning insular and inward. Um, so that sort of brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm coming to the questions in a moment, but I just want to end with this note that what you see in terms of lessons for governments and corporations when we are at the deep center of the pandemic is probably not going to be the legacy of this crisis. At the deep center of the pandemic, everybody wants to build anti-fragile, uh, highly resilient economic systems and are ready to spend whatever money it takes to do that. And everybody gets emboldened by talks of separation and we're looking because that also works well on a domestic political level. But I think that as the pandemic subsides, and it will, I have no doubt about that, and as we get a better hold of how to calibrate our economies in the post-pandemic world, we probably will not go for such radical solutions uh, as the one that were envisaged even a couple of years ago. So I don't think the uh, future of global trade and finance and so on is one of massive restriction. I think there's still a window where like-minded people, open-minded people can come together and hopefully by the end of the year take us to a better direction than where we are right now. So that's my 50 minutes worth of talking. Uh, I will spend the next few minutes of this live stream uh, addressing the questions that were submitted in our page. Uh, is the Fed heading toward negative rates? Oh, by the way, these questions are all on slide 36. Um, the answer is no. Uh, I sat in a webinar with Bill Dudley, former chairman of New York Fed, and I've had other conversations with central bankers from the U.S. in St. Louis and New York and Washington and elsewhere. And by and large, everybody says that the A economist level and management level, the Fed is highly skeptical of the efficacy of negative interest rates, whereas keenly aware of the various economic and political downsides to introducing negative rate. So, no, I don't think the Fed is heading toward negative rates. Zero rates, yes, we're there. Uh, more QE, yes, sure. Yield curve control, yes, but um, negative rates, no. Next question, how will the new SORA regime uh, go for forward pricing be affected, if any, by the current macro events? Well, the answer is that they will be closely related to the movement that we have seen in cyber and which by extension follows or tracks the movement in U.S. Treasuries. Um, so the difference between the SORA and the cyber is that, you know, one doesn't include uh, the term uh, component. Uh, 
But beyond that, uh, the tracking at the short end of the market will be very close to the cyber in our view. And you can, of course, look at our publications for our latest forecast on the interest rate side. How do we see U.S.-China relationship developing with the COVID-19 situation under control? Well, it's not under control in the U.S. And as far as the development of the relationship is concerned, I think it will remain tenuous in a Trump-1 and Trump-2 presidency or a Trump-1 and Biden presidency. It will remain tenuous. And I don't think uh, power shifting from one party to the other in the U.S. would necessarily change that. Uh, bashing China is a bipartisan sport in the U.S. these days. And, of course, it will not be very good for markets. The markets are, I think, right now uh, very much in the hangover mode from the massive injection of liquidity and compression of spreads. There will be some reckoning, uh, and uh, and I think we should watch out for that. Uh, and geopolitics and the U.S. China level should certainly be a trigger that will probably create unrest in financial markets. Next question is a tricky one. View on Hong Kong's Internal Security Act and its impact on the financial sector. And the region, well, the impact from the perspective of the dissidents is an unambiguous negative, and the number of dissidents in Hong Kong is not small. So it could lead to further flare-up of protests, which can lead to more arrests and so on, and that is a risk we have to worry about. But I think increasingly China's market, Hong Kong's market is looking at China, and since China is doing decently, Hong Kong is doing decently. Can't really see that dynamic changing too much unless we get really, really worse than expected real economic data out of Hong Kong or significantly better than expected. As long as the forecast horizon is largely reflecting what will actually be the case uh, from consensus forecaster, I'm not going to worry too much about um, the outlook for this, uh, for, for Hong Kong. Um, what are the long-term impact that we'll see due to the financial ripple effect? I think it relates to my earlier slide on industrial policy and the long-term direction of Fed policy. So I don't want to add much more to that. Bottom line is financial markets will remain strongly supported by huge amount of liquidity and low rates going forward, which makes leverage position taking very easy. Next is an FX question. Will we see USD weakening the same magnitude as 0809? Understand we saw it below 120. Um, very, very briefly, I think that uh, the Fed, uh, for the Singapore's monetary authority will probably, having taken their slope of their um, monetary policy uh, direction to zero uh, for the normal effective exchange rate, there isn't a whole lot for them to do other than you know widening the widening the band or recentering the band. Um, and uh, and therefore, if the expectation is there's not a whole lot more coming from the monetary policy side, I don't think there will be much expectation of the exchange rate getting affected in a very big way. Of course, there's a very popular narrative, which is a short dollar narrative and a long euro narrative. Around that narrative, if that were to transpire, same dollar would appreciate, but more toward like the mid 130s or low 130s in the strongest scenario, not going well below 130 in my view. Uh, how should investors allocate their portfolio, rotation out of bonds into equities? Absolutely not. Uh, first of all, my colleague Wei Fu Fu, who's the Wei Fu Fu, who's the CIO of DPS Private Bank, is a better position to answer that question. Uh, but my perspective, uh, the equity markets are exceptionally frothy, particularly the U.S. but and elsewhere as well. Uh, and I don't buy the argument that uh, the yield. Uh, out of equity markets is high enough to justify the amount of risk taking that is going on relative to bonds. So no, I would be very careful about the equity market outlook, which has, of course, run in record magnitude in the last three, four months, which is another reason I think that there's very little upside left for the rest of the year. Finally, is the U.S. dollar due for a crash? If so to what level? The answer is no. The U.S. dollar may be due for a correction, given the interest rate differential between the U.S. and the euro uh, on but nil. Um, but I don't think it falls to the ground. So um, uh, some degree of uh, you know, capital moving from U.S. to Europe to emerging market Asia would galvanize that short dollar long um, EMFX and uh, G3 minus U.S. currencies. That is possible, but uh, that could lead to some gentle correction. So let's say the euro goes toward 120 or so. But uh, beyond that, massive crash, I doubt it. I mean, I think the most revealing aspect of the COVID-19 related panic in February was how the U.S. dollar soared. Uh, everybody was extremely worried about the U.S. economy. Everybody was worried about what the financial markets were going to do. But still, everybody brought their liquidity, their cash into U.S. accounts. So that tells you that it is hard for the U.S. to 
have massively, you know, massively large movement of their currencies simply because if the large movement is warranted because of bearish reasons, risk aversion may actually propel some flows into the U.S. If the um, expectations are being influ uh, influenced by very positive data, well, then opportunistic money will come to the U.S. They can push the dollar up. Uh, so against that, I, I recognize the lack of interest rate differential between U.S. assets and the rest of the world. I do realize that from a valuation perspective, also probably some argument for some U.S. Dep dollar depreciation, but a crash, I doubt it. So uh, we're about uh, 355 minutes to the uh, 355. I'm going to close the live stream for now. Uh, I thank you very much for joining us. I think there are about 300 of you registering and logging in from around the world. Uh, you, this has been one more uh, session of DBS Macro Insights live stream. If you want to receive our research, uh, you can Google DBS Research Library uh, and find everything from multimedia to publications to these PowerPoint slides, uh, everything posted on that. Uh, so do look out for that. And again, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we will see you a month from now. Bye-bye.